seminar. Um, I can see it's nearly a full house and there are a lot of people online as well. Um, this week, I'm delighted um, to introduce Dr. Robert Califf, um, who's going to talk to us. Uh, Dr. Califf is the, the current um, commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, having previously also served under Barack Obama in the same role. Um, he initially trained in cardiology at Duke University and was a professor of medicine. Um, and before joining the FDA, he was uh, he led several influential trials in cardiovascular disease um, and is one of the most highly cited uh, medical researchers. As FDA commissioner, he remains interested in methods, infrastructure and regulation of clinical research. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about the ongoing effort to generate the evidence needed to inform decisions about health and healthcare, a US perspective. But before I welcome him, I'd just like to mention, um, I've been asked to, to mention that there'll be a few photos being taken. So if, if anybody has any objections, if they could go and speak to Graham over there in the, in the corner. Um, and also, although this seminar needs to finish at two o'clock, um, I, I think Dr. Califf has about half an hour afterwards before he needs to actually escape and move on to the next uh, stage of his journey. So hopefully there'll be a bit of time to mingle outside. Um, but welcome, Dr. Califf. Thanks so much for the introduction. And um, I've used my trips to Oxford over the years in many ways to sort of, as ideas evolve to set benchmarks in my own thinking. There's one thing I can always count on, particularly with one gentleman on the front row, is um, a lot of criticism of my thinking and what <laughs> it may or may not mean. And um, I think today is a, uh, for me, is another opportunity to do that because we are giving it a good effort in the U.S. to look at particular parts of our evidence generation system and what we can do. So what you're going to hear today is a bit probably discombobulated because it's uh, thinking and evolution, uh, a lot happening with some new leaders and opportunities, but also a lot to acknowledge about um, the past. Let's see different keyboard that I'm used to, but that's good. So here's the context. Um, obviously, there are a lot of issues affecting the global evidence generation system. And one thing that uh, Professor Pito has already uh, pointed out to me again today is that globally, we're actually seeing a reduction in death rates and overall survival. In the U.S., we're seeing the opposite. So one could argue whether anything we say about the U.S. should pertain to the rest of the world. But um, I happen to know that what we do does have some influence, and maybe there will be some generalizable ideas here. But I do want to give you insight into what's happening in the, U in the U.S., because um, I think it does uh, have an impact. We met with MHRA uh, yesterday, and we're headed on to the European Commission and the and, uh, e EMA the next couple of days, because... Uh, there's a lot at stake in how we either work together or don't work together going forward. So first of all, I always feel obligated to just remind people of what the FDA is, because it seems like everybody has an opinion about the FDA, but often I find that people uh, don't um, uh, actually capture the remit that um, we have. We regulate about uh, 20 to 25% of every dollar spent uh, in the U.S. And just to go through the items that we regulate, this is one sort of axis, as I think of it, of what we regulate. A very large part of what we do is food. So the F and FDA does stand for food, just to remind you. And this will have an impact on some of the things I have to say later on. We finally, after years of trying, just got authority to regulate cosmetics in a better way, and just the quiz I like to give on this, how many cosmetics does the average woman in the U.S. use per day? The answer is 12. But here's a surprise for almost everyone. How many does the average man in the U.S. use per day? The answer is actually six, because if you think about shampoo, deodorant, all those kind of things are labeled as cosmetics. And there's some really important health issues involved in this multi-billion dollar industry. Probably the most underappreciated part of the FDA is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. A lot of discussion now about genetics and genomics related to uh, the human species. But if you think about 3,000 species and all the issues that are involved 
uh, both in the food supply, but also in the pets that we care about and animals that we otherwise care about. This is uh, in our remit and a real opportunity to look at genetics and genomics across uh, the species. Obviously, everybody pretty much knows about FDA regulates drugs, devices, and an increasing number uh, with embedded digital systems, including uh, the advent of AI that I'll say a little bit about in a minute. <clears throat> and then, of course, biologics, and uh, very rapidly growing part of our po portfolio with a huge number of advances happening at a pace that scientifically very difficult to keep up with. And then the newest part of our portfolio is tobacco, which um, was just added to the FDA's portfolio 14 years ago, and is sort of still in evolution in terms of how we regulate it. And a lot at stake. We're going to lose about 460,000 Americans this year to tobacco-related disease, and we have a major epidemic of teenagers getting addicted to nicotine through vaping, and how to deal with that is um, quite a dilemma. So I'm not showing you this to create sympathy, but I would like a little sympathy in terms of the scope of what we have to think about um, on a daily basis. But um, the other vector or axis that is what is it that we actually are doing with regulation? And this is written into U.S. law. I'm also amazed by how many people, as I go about my everyday life, assume the FDA can just magically say something like, I met with Senator Sanders a couple of weeks ago and he had his staff plop down a Coca-Cola in front of me and said, I want you to declare tomorrow that no teenagers can drink Coca-Cola. And I said, well, Senator, you know, we actually can't do that without a law being passed. Um, it's actually your side of the house that has to take care of this. But obviously, uh, safety is the number one uh, remit that we have and something that people depend on. If they eat a meal, they want to depend on uh, the, the lack of possibility that they're going to get sick or die from eating the meal. And the same goes for the other products that we regulate. But also efficacy and increasingly security um, is an issue that is of great concern as the supply chain globally has gotten more complicated. I didn't expect to be a supply chain expert this time around. It was hardly anything that I paid a lot of attention to in 2016 in my first round as FDA commissioner, but it's taken up a huge amount of my time because um, I think most people would be surprised if they actually understood the issues that are currently in play, of the, not only the complexity of our supply chain, but um, the way that it's handled in terms of risks um, to not only supply, but the quality of the products that we depend on. I was in a meeting yesterday without revealing the source where someone maintained that globally outside of EU and USA and certain parts of Asia, antibiotics that are bought in uh, drugstores, 80% are actually not the drug that you think you're buying. And um, obviously we have to protect our populations against that, but also try to do something about how the global supply chain affects what happens in other countries. Um, tobacco, I've already mentioned. Um, but right, <laughs> right there with safety is um, in our mission is advancing uh, innovation. And I think it's pretty hard to argue that U.S. is not the source of a lot of innovation and creative ideas. But as we'll get into, the question is, what are we doing with those products in the U.S. to achieve the results we're achieving? And what is the role of the FDA and other parts of the U.S. government in dealing with that in our particular society? And then the next bullet here is one that um, is surprisingly difficult. And I had a hard time getting people to pay attention to this in 2016. But now with the pandemic, uh, with the vaccine uh, issues, uh, Rory Collins down there has, has a great lecture on statins and misinformation related to statins. Uh, getting uh, an information across to the public, 340 million Americans, is an extremely difficult job given the heterogeneity of the population and the different ways that people are now ingesting information. More about that at the end of the lecture. And then finally, the one that was least understood in 2016, but now is pretty obvious, a good bit of our effort um, is uh, related to preparing for um, catastrophic societal events, whether it be a pandemic or 
uh, nuclear attack, um, you name it. We have to spend time and energy um, preparing for what happens um, if uh, such an event occurs. So here's the opportunities I see it on the, um, and I'm going to focus on the medical product side with some allusion, some allusion to other components of what we regulate. Um, there's just no question that a lot of things that we dreamed about and sort of studied in a textbook 30 years ago are now happening. Um, obviously, you all have been a big part of it. Uh, the UK Biobank is a stellar um, motivating um, example for the rest of the world. And now we're seeing these scientific advances translated into um, interventions. But there's no question that this tremendous in, uh, innovation that's occurring, largely driven by U.S. capital and um, companies that are evolving out of the U.S., is not accruing to the benefit of the American population the way it is to other parts of the world. And so if we could figure out the right policies in the context of the differences that America has compared to other places, um, there's a tremendous opportunity to improve health. And um, I do think that uh, what's happened before um, does provide a basis from which we can go forward. And if we have um, make certain changes in our policies, um, have a significant um, advantage across this whole spectrum of things that we uh, regulate, just for example, digital interventions in health, uh, tremendous opportunity there, particularly now that everyone has a cell phone, everyone's online. I don't know what's happening here, but um, if you're under 30 in the U.S., it's almost 100 percent Instagram and TikTok for getting uh, news. And um, we're obviously not super facile at communicating with people uh, on those media. Well, I mean... I don't need to show you all the data, um, but I think everyone's aware that if we look at high income countries, um, uh, U.S. is at the bottom of the heap and headed the wrong direction. The good news is, since this article came out in Washington Post, the latest data showed a slight uptick in life expectancy in the U.S., but still far behind um, other countries like um, this one and with the gap uh, widening. Now, um, I think it's fair to argue, as shown in this slide, that you could do something simple like have a primary care system and it would probably make the difference. But we can't depend on the in the U.S. on such a change to occur. And so um, in the policies that we can, given the culture that we're in, we have to work around this with incremental changes. This is obviously a doctor slide from Twitter, but it's a graph that's used over and over. And it's, it's really remarkable. If you look at um, bottom left-hand corner, around 1970, the U.S. looked like just about every other high-income country. And as time evolved, um, uh, we've diverged in both axes, both in cost um, and in uh, life expectancy in the wrong direction. So this year, we were able to proudly proclaim that we have spent $4.5 trillion on health care um, in the United States for the worst result of any high-income country. Now, I understood that uh, Mike Gaziano gave a lecture yesterday and proclaimed the value of the VA system. There's probably a lot in that. And feel free to correct anything I say that's not right. But um, whoever doctored up this slide, which I really like, said the rest of the world moved to cheaper and more effective. We used to more expensive and less effective. And probably at the basis of it is uh, the lack of a primary care system that functions to provide the basic things that are known uh, to make a difference. Okay, but that gets a little far away from the FDA. What's the part that we can affect? Because we're not accountable for the healthcare delivery system. But what can we do with our compatriots um, in our part of the government to try to uh, improve the situation? And this goes back to my um, origins and uh, my first trip to Oxford, I still remember you had the women who were answering the telephone to do randomization. And um, that was the best technology that existed. Then the fax machine came along and made things possible. But what was so obvious, then, and I took for granted uh, in my early career, is that this would just happen because it seemed so obvious that essentially we have all these great ideas. 
great science. And yesterday in a meeting with the British American business group, uh, the industry was heavily represented wanting earlier access to innovative therapies for the UK. And I'm all for that, but my point is scientific innovation, most of it doesn't work. And the only way you know if it works is to do a clinical trial and get the answer. And in fact, we're still seeing at the FDA, well, I'll say a a word about what the hit rate is of drugs that make it into phase one. But if you've done the right clinical trials, it ought to be the case that once you know what you should do, that you can measure um, whether you're doing it or not and uh, create a learning system that continuously feeds back and also identifies gaps in the system that are obvious. And I would argue that in certain areas of medicine, that has been the norm, Um, uh, the acute coronary syndrome space and heart failure, for example, and cardiology. But it is... um, has not taken off to the degree that it should, and we don't have a great learning health system. And the question is, what's the part uh, where we can make the biggest difference right now? This is sort of the bottom line. If you want to nap through the rest of the lecture, that's uh, that's fine. Hopefully, we'll have some good Q and A's. Um, I, I, as I've studied this, um, like some other people in this room, I used to spend a lot of time lecturing people at the FDA about what they weren't doing right. And I've now come to realize that a lot of the reason that they weren't interested in my lectures is I was talking about a set of um, evidence generation activities that didn't pertain for the most part to what they spend their time doing. Most of their effort has been in the pre-approval system of phase one and phase two clinical trials, which require intense uh, measurement, a lot of detail. You don't know what's going to happen when you put a new molecule or a new device in a human being. Um, and so I'm just going to declare that part of the system works pretty well. And if you want to argue about that, I'm happy to entertain the argument. But where we're really failing is once you've gotten through that early phase and you know the thing could work, um, how to apply that in practice. There are many, many questions that go unanswered in our current system. And by the way, it's an area where the FDA does not have authority to require studies uh, to be done. It's more in a territory that's shared among a number of organizations, which may mean that no one has accountability for it when many organizations do. I'd also argue that um, there is a set of diseases, and we had a good talk about this this morning. It sort of falls in between, because if you look at, for example, the big cardiovascular areas, the phase three trials look more like post-approval trials in other areas of medicine that deal with much smaller populations with much more intensive therapies and not population-based. I also um, have come to firmly believe that we need something entirely different for rare disease, and we are seeing a huge wave of um, gene modification, including, you know, easiest to talk about gene editing. It looks like it works. And, you know, how it's going to work in every single disease is unknown, but we're facing 10,000 rare diseases, probably with a genetic basis where there's good reason to believe that if we spent the time and energy, um, we could have effective treatments. You may have heard that both U.S. and U.K. just approved gene editing for sickle cell disease. Um, But there's so many questions about how to deal with this amazing triumph of science How do we pay for just the companies to develop a a reproducible way of delivering uh, the treatment for small groups of patients? And then if we have 10,000 rare diseases, let's say 200 get effective treatments in the next five years. Right now, it's a million to two million bucks of uh, treatment. Um, That's not something that any of us are prepared to deal with. So we're going to need a whole set of policies and thoughts about how to deal with uh, with rare disease and the triumph of science. It's a good problem to have, but we don't have solutions right now. And so to get to the mundane stuff, which we've been working on for decades, as I look at uh, where we need to focus, it's data, it's research operations, ethics, and priorities to get this um, straightened out. And this fundamental issue that we've talked about forever, how do we integrate research and practice so that it's not two separate things? And um, I think you have the shining example that everyone talks about with the uh, recovery um, trials. Um, 
But in the U.S., um, these systems have become more and more separate over time, uh, making it, except maybe in the VA, but uh, the separateness makes it very difficult to embed trials in clinical practice to answer questions that are essential to understand what to do uh, with patients in practice. So this is my justification for not worrying about phase one, phase two, the sort of vast majority of work of the FDA. It's We just looked, and it looks like, despite all the lectures about how great we are at picking biological targets, it's still the case that 90% of drugs that get into phase one don't make it to market because they either have a toxicity that was unexpected, they engage the target but don't have the biological effect that was um, hoped for, or something else happens that just makes it so it's not going to get there. So most of the effort in the pre-approval space at FDA is spent trying to separate the things that can't possibly work from the things that do work, at least for a given indication. And the amount of money that has to get spent for all the failures is a, is a huge um, issue that I think, by and large, people don't understand. That is, when we talk about the cost uh, of developing a drug, we can't just talk about the ones that made it. We've got to talk about all the ones that didn't make it. Um, but on the other side of the coin, um, and this is uh, work that I was very involved in and I'm led to believe by people currently looking that it hasn't gotten better, it's still the case that the vast majority of um, clinical practice guidelines, that is um, the um, guidance for clinicians about what to do in practice, the vast majority is not based on high quality evidence. It's based on some mixture of low quality evidence and expert opinion. And the, the question I think that's in front of us is um, given the fact that we essentially have control of the pre market space, what can we do um, once these products get on the market um, to um, have an evidence generation system that gives people the answers that they really need uh, and deserve where the system is currently? not doing its job. This is just a schematic as we tried to put this together and how to think about it policy-wise, uh, try to motivate our colleagues and the rest of the federal government. So um, if you look at a typical drug or device development, the National Institutes of Health has a big role in the very early phases of innovation and creative ideas. Then it gets turned over to industry, which is operating in a regulated space defined by U.S. law and governed by the FDA. But once you get beyond that first approval, um, there is no one who's in charge, and yet we all have an interest. And um, if you follow U.S. politics, a major factor here is the IRA, which is now declared that for the first time, CMS, the big payer in the U.S., can negotiate with companies for specified drugs near the end of the product life cycle. And CMS has said they're going to look at evidence that's generated between the time of approval and the time the negotiation starts. That's going to be a big motivating factor. I had an interesting discussion with Rory about whether it's going to be negative or positive for what companies do. I think in the long run it's going to be positive because people will realize they'll get a better price if they can actually justify it based on the evidence that shows that it's worth uh, the value. And so we're now working across um, Health and Human Services, CDC, FDA, and NIH to see what we can do about this post approval space to develop systems that might be more effective. Now, we're starting, one nice thing for us is we're starting from a pretty poor position. And many of you have seen uh, these data that uh, came from Janet Woodcock's work. Um, during COVID, and it just looked at arms of randomized trials for what proportion could have possibly answered a useful question. And so an interesting place to start is to ask the question, why is it that we're doing so many small, crappy trials that can't answer the question of interest? And, of course, the reason is embedded in the, in the um, sort of uh, structure of the U.S. academic system where the way you get promoted is to have your name on a paper that gets published. Um, and also we have fellows who need to get trained with a requirement that they do research. And so a lot of these are trials that fellows are doing that everyone knew didn't have a chance of answering a meaningful question, but it was um, put out there as a, 
um, way to train people. I might argue that's not a great way to train people is to do trials that don't mean anything. But um, it, it's a, so we're starting with a lot of money being spent on and a lot of people volunteering for research, which doesn't answer a meaningful question. I would separate this from industry where it's not hard to um, discern well why industry is doing a trial. If it's pre-market, it's to get approval from the FDA. If it's post-market, it's either to justify payment by an insurer or to increase the value of their asset, which is a drug or a device. It's not for a public health reason, and that's built into the structure. But right now, there is um, not a large effort to do things that are in the interest of public health in the system. And so, um, you know, we have this saying that Kirk Furberg uh, who many of you uh, have known, um, coin and God we trust, all others must bring high-quality, reliable evidence. And that's true in the pre-market space, but in the post-market space, um, there is no one who um, guarantees and authorizes that. And so um, this is meant to show one happy family and the U.S. federal government all working together to fix this problem. But you'll notice, uh, Michael, the VA is here, and uh, we're, we're, uh, we see the VA as a really great example, which by its design actually has research integrated into um, practice. And, um, you know, the question is, how much can we move the rest of the U.S. system that way, knowing that we can't do the big thing that would need to happen, which is to redo the entire health system, because that would require opening up a whole bunch of laws that, God only knows what would happen right now if that were to occur. And the good news is there's interest uh, throughout the whole system. Um, and, you know, I would point you to 2016 in my first term. We wrote about this, uh, but then an election happened, and most of us that wrote about it uh, went into other jobs at that point. And I'm not here to go through the details, but if you're interested, I think what we laid out in 2016 is still – pretty much the roadmap that we're looking at, but with a lot learned over the last few years and a lot of changes in technology that make this much more possible than it was. I'd also refer you to uh, the website of the Reagan Udall Foundation. One thing that I was able to do, the Reagan Udall Foundation is a foundation that supports the FDA and serves as an interface with the private sector in ways that we can't do from the point of being U.S. government employees. So um, we asked them to do a report on uh, post-market evidence generation. They got a lot of really smart people and they gave us, I think it was 32 discrete recommendations on what to do. And I think um, it would be of interest to many of you to take a look at that report. It's pretty easy to digest and not surprising. This is just a statement from them at the, in the introduction and some of the people um, who were involved, you may recognize some of these names. But in our way is this phenomenon. If you haven't read this article, I would highly recommend it. It's not novel. Um, it's, a, it's really just like a review paper of um, other people's work on something called financialization. And what's happened in the U.S. health system is it's all being run now based on the same financial calculations that are used by businesses of any kind. And this means that if you want to insert research into the system, you have to come up with some way to deal with a system which is pushing patients through at the fastest possible rate to generate the most revenue for the system. It also points out a really interesting thing that if you look at not-for-profit health systems in the U.S., and I was on the executive committee of one that's fairly well known, um, the side of the portfolio that gets the most attention now is actually the investment side of the portfolio because that's where the major opportunity is to make money. And you would think a health system would be mostly focused on uh, the oper operations of clinical care. But um, in order to uh, pay for everything, um, investments turn out to be a really important part of it. And if you combine financialization with this concept of suboptimization, and part of the reason I think you all need to hear this is I see some signs the UK has a tendency to go the same direction sometimes. And I think it's something people need to be aware of. So th this is an article in the New England Journal about 
Um, a patient who had pancreatic cancer, he thought, he was diagnosed, underwent a Whipple operation, survived it, and a year later, um, he learned that he actually never had pancreatic cancer to begin with. But he was very happy with his care because everything was done just right. And the problem was one part of the system wasn't communicating with another. It just took a year for all the scans and information to get to one place where someone could tell him he actually never had it to begin with. And the point of it was the whole system worked well, except it wasn't um, put together in a way that delivered uh, the hope for a result. And this is a well-described term in business, and it's also very noticeable in the U.S. government right now, I think. By the way, I used to blame everything on the British Empire, and um, now I blame everything on McKinsey because this is something that McKinsey taught a lot of people, which is optimize your own components' well-being, and with a hope that if you opt- each group optimizes its own well-being, that the sum that will be great, uh, the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. But actually, the reverse is happening in most situations. Um, in healthcare, and also think um, in the U.S. government. And then we add to it this third, so there are these three obstacles that we just have to understand, I think, to begin to think about how to deal with this. This is actually from Genesis. It's about the Tower of Babel. And if we add to it the fact that we have, for whatever reason in medicine, decided to use different names for the same thing and the same name for different things, it makes it very hard for us to aggregate data even in the face of a situation where all 340 million Americans have electronic health records that have treasure troves of data um, in it. And so um, if we deal with financialization, suboptimization, and the Tower of Babel, but the question is, what can we do about all these things to create a better system? So first, the data. We're awash in data. And what we've got to do is to uh, reduce the uh, Tower of Babel. Um, and, you know, these are just some of the facts about it, I think. And the good news is it's getting better and better. Um, there are data standards that are evolving. There used to be hundreds of data sta- data standards. You could pick the one you liked, which is not a good thing for standards, as you all know. But now uh, there's consolidation of standards occurring and a hope that we can um, standardize in a much more um, efficient way uh, going forward. And in the 21st Century Cures Act, um, a few years back during my time, uh, the U.S. government was given authority to um, impose data standards so that people will have to start using the same name for the same things and not using different names for those things. Um, And I, I think if you look at the situation that we're in now relative to where I hope we can make progress, There's sort of several models now. One is uh, the regulated industry, which by and large collects data in separate systems to answer the research questions. And for reasons that um, we've discussed this morning, um, we'll spend whatever it takes to do that. Because if you don't get through the FDA, you don't um, get your product on the market. And in discussions with MHRA, it's obviously the same here. But um, in this post-market space, unfortunately, I think the same way of thinking has pervaded these areas where you don't need to do um, all the same things that are happening uh, in the pre-market space. And so now we have this evolution of whole different types of trials, ranging from, you know, what you all popularized, the large simple trials collected on a couple of sheets of paper and sent by a fax machine, that is something that um, includes um, hybridization and the use of EHR data, as you did um, in the recovery trial. And even in many circumstances, just using EHR data at the setting is right. But, of course, the key is knowing um, what the purpose is and being fit for purpose in the design of your trial. And so one of our um, ideas in working through this is we've got to get it through people's heads in the research system that – what works in phase one and two clinical trials is not the same as what works in other kinds of trials. Now, it may seem obvious to you who are experts in trials, but you'd be surprised if you uh, were out there um, in, in the rest of the world that we deal with. And of course, the concept with the HRs has been around since the HMOs. I think 
Martin or Rory said that uh, the NHS is just a big HMO, and I think there's a lot to say for that. But the idea is if you're collecting um, data once, you ought to be able to use it multiple times and not have to collect the same data multiple times for different uses if you can possibly avoid that. Now, this gets into this thing that I know is um, – in the basis of many the many discussions I've had with uh, Professor Pito, um, we are big advocates of real world evidence at the FDA, and it's growing. It's written into 21st century cures. There's a serious effort to make it happen, but by real world evidence, we do not mean sloppy observational studies of existing data. And randomization is very much a key component of real world evidence, and I would argue that. The ISIS trials were classic examples of real-world evidence. You took people coming into practices, you collected a little bit of data, and you got answers in clinical practice, not in a separate research setting. So I think it's really critical as we talk about this, this is an area of terminology, that we separate real-world data, which is using data from EHRs and cell phones and um, sensors and other technology, um, and then applying a method to that data, um, in many cases randomization, but in certain other cases other methods that will get the answers that you need. We, there was a discussion going on about step wedge um, trials that was just going on. But what we're seeing is that when people say real world evidence, there's an assumption that that means you just take a bunch of data and perform some magic and get an answer. And I think we all know it doesn't work that way and in funded work by the FDA, um, you know, I think the standards for when observational data can be used in a rational way are getting better and better, and the answer is not that often. And I think one of the great tragedies of the pandemic were the thousands of papers from observational data that made claims that turned out to be incorrect when looked at in a randomized trial. So I'm not going to dwell on these slides, but I just wanted to uh, we're spending a large amount of time now with the NIH thinking through what is under the hood when you make a simple statement like everyone has an EHR, let's just use the data. And um, the current state is like um, much less of a mess, believe it or not, than it used to be. But um, there are many players in the system. There's a lot of transformation. And a point along the way here is information is lost at every step. Uh, that goes on here, and mistakes and errors uh, can be made. And we have multiple data models that are used. And what we'd like to do is get to um, working through the U.S. government for standards for research data, which are directly attached to clinical care standards, so that when a, a clinician sees a patient in the clinic, that information that's recorded is usable for research with a set of definitions um, that are understood. And I don't have time to go through all the details, but let's just say the technology is like a thousand times better than it was even five years ago to make this happen. And I have 100% confidence that it's not a technological issue at this point. It's really a question of whether we can exert discipline at the point of care and create systems in this financialized, sub-optimized Tower of Babel, create systems that encourage people to move towards a situation where you can learn from your clinical practice as you go along. And of course, even if we perfect that, it won't solve all the problems. And we're making a list of all the problems that will not be solved just by having access to the EHR data. So then we get to the um, clinical trial operations. And you know, this is an old slide for me but um, actually have some degree of enthusiasm that we're going to uh, make this better. And it, it literally is the case um, if you look at the U.S. and you were just to poll like primary care clinicians, do you want to do research or not? I think the vast majority would say they would love to do research, but they don't want to do it in the current system because they're under tremendous pressure to see a lot of patients. By the way, I've read some news stories. You may have some similar issues in that regard. Uh, here right now. And the question is, can we develop uh, systems and protocols which are comfortable and helpful in patient care rather than being seen as an exogenous foreign object that's exerted, that's um, embedded in clinical care? 
And so um, thanks to um, uh, the Reagan Udall Foundation and many others, um, we've come up with a list. This is just sort of a summary of items that are on the list. None of these are new. In the midst of all this, we have um, ICHE6, which I know is one of Rory and Martin's favorite um, topics. They keep providing useful feedback. Martin, how many pages of comments did you send on the last version? Yeah, it's a lot of pages. But, um, you know, in the context of all this, we've got to um, develop standards that are not just useful for U.S. or U.K., but obviously other parts of the world. And um, we have these problems that are well known, which now I think across the U.S. government, there's interest in trying to solve, which has never uh, really been there before. I will say I was intrigued by the um, NIHR and the concept of directly paying trusts for enrollment in clinical trials. And, you know, we'll see how all that works out as a model because of um, in the midst of all this, the NIH has uh, announced it's going to launch a primary care research network in the U.S. that will be based in practices in rural and underserved areas. And this will be the um, this will be the place where we hope to work out the models of how to make uh, clinic friendly research, answering questions that are relevant to what practitioners are facing every day about the interventions that they're um, either using or trying to decide whether to use. Um, there are a whole bunch of ethics questions that are embedded in here, and I've sort of had the pleasure. We hired uh, a group of ethicists from Johns Hopkins on contract to the FDA to help us think about these things. But um, this, this uh, I think most of us who do research believe that it's a human benefit to participate in research, but there are many other people who think that it's um, – uh, not a benefit that it takes extraordinary um, willingness to put yourself at risk and that people need to be protected at all costs. And where in that um, difference uh, we need to fall, I think, is a major question that will impact this. Because if you look at a system where a clinician has uh, 10 minutes a patient and you say you need to actually explain uh, consent to a patient in the midst of your busy clinical practice, um, it's just not feasible in a lot of situations unless, unless we figured out how to get this balance right. And then there's this issue that I alluded to of what questions are um, asked. And simply put, I've been on all sides of this equation, whether it's the corporate world, the academic world, or the regulatory world. And I think industry-funded studies are highly valuable in the post-approval state. But the metric by which a company decides whether to do a clinical trial is essentially a net present value calculation. Is it going? Is it likely to accrue to the financial well-being of the company, which is selling and uh, distributing the product? And we need to have a voice for public health in this, which hasn't existed too much. There's been an assumption at the NIH that if industry would pay for it, the NIH shouldn't be involved. But I think we're going to see a change in that view, and how to actually make that happen is going to be a very interesting thing to watch. And, of course, the role of patients is something that we're all talking about. Just a quick word about rare disease. I've already uh, mentioned this, but I do think we're going to have to pause and rethink what we're doing with rare disease in general. Um, we can't just patch this up because... My view of the science is evolving at a breathtaking pace, and we need a system that can deal with it because um, when you talk to parents of children who have a 100% chance of dying and you can see that this is within possibility, um, we have to do it, but we can't do it the way we're currently doing it and have the system survive. So uh, for those of you interested in this, I hope that we'll um, rethink how we deal with rare disease in general. So um, the summary slide um, on, on the system overall is right now we still have a system in the U.S. that where products get on the market, we have a passive surveillance system, which is helpful, but not the whole story. It's parallel to clinical practice. It's not embedded in clinical practice. 
And um, we do these inefficient one-off studies trying to get answers to questions. And what we'd like to see is a system of active surveillance using the electronic health records, which are now readily available. And we do use them in uh, systems that the FDA uses, but there's a huge lag and we pay a huge amount of money to get access to that data. And this really should be a public health asset in our view. And we should embed clinical trials in the um, clinical practice system to answer the questions that are of highest priority for the public health. One sub-project we're doing in this effort is a national problem list. What are the biggest questions that need to be answered? Of course, everybody has a different view of that, but if we're going to make decisions about what to fund in this primary care network, it should be based on public health priority, not um, other criteria. And then my dream world would look something like um, what I'm going to show you now. It's a long time coming. I'm 100% sure this will happen, but probably after I'm in the nursing home, so I'm counting on younger people to make this happen. If you look at the American system now, every part of it, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, a health system, a clinic says we are patient-centered. But really what you have is a system that looks like this. It's about as far from patient-centered as you can possibly imagine. And for those of you, I've been to the U.S. and tried to get a primary care appointment. I think that's all I need to say. Um, and so the question is, how do we create some order out of this chaos? And at least it seems to me that we have some activities that should be part of a learning health system that when patients and families get involved, and we see this reproducibly in the FDA because we've been focused on patient-centered um, activities now for some time, they want all this done, the, the, the discovery research and the clinical trials to get the answers that they need. The question is, how do they get it done? And we've got this group of things in green here, which are there to support patients, whether it's a research clinic or a healthcare system or a patient advocacy organization, but they're totally chaotic right now and don't work together. It would be nice if they did. And we have a whole bunch of R&D organizations and payers who are also disaggregated and often at odds with each other in terms of what they want. And so the hope would be to create some organization there and more access to common information. And I actually think in a um, peculiar American way, this is actually the key to the whole thing. It's good. There's a thing about equal access to information, which is, um, I think, absolutely essential. Right now in the American system, everybody hoards their data for a whole variety of reasons, making it very hard to get, um, regardless of who you are in the system, getting the other person's data is hard to do. So the section at the bottom, what's under the hood there, is where a lot of activity is going to go on. And the idea is to democratize the data, which brings up all these issues of ethics, um, how do you keep things confidential, et cetera, where I think you all have made a good bit of progress, but we learned from MHRA that you've got some interesting discussions going on here about um, concerns about how to keep data confidential and what it means when different people get access to it. Last point I want to make, and then I'll finish, I guess five minutes late, but not too late. Um, as I was growing up, I had this confidence that if you had the cycle of knowledge and you did the right clinical trials, you developed overwhelming evidence, everything would work, and it seemed to be the case. But I never could have imagined that with the most overwhelming data you could possibly imagine, we still can't convince a lot of people uh, that it's the right thing to do. So if you look at the American public um, right now, um, it's an alarming number of people who have no confidence in vaccines and believe that ivermectin is the best treatment for um, COVID, for example. If you look at confidence in our public um, organizations, it's not so good. Um, at hearings, I frequently get chided by Congress because confidence in the FDA is um, not 100 percent. Unfortunately, I can't tell them what I really want to say, which is that confidence in Congress is a lot lower than FDA. But um, that wouldn't go over very well in a hearing. And so we've got to figure out together how to deal no matter what we do on the evidence generation side, it's not going to help us if people don't believe it and don't have confidence in what we're doing. 
And globally right now, um, thanks to the ubiquity of the Internet, um, if you thought 10 minutes about a problem but you're an influencer, you can affect millions of people in a matter of a few minutes um, on the Internet. We don't have a solution to that because we're accustomed to thinking that if we get the right answer and tell people about it once, that that's going to carry the day. It's clearly not carrying the day in the U.S., I'd refer you to another Reagan Udall report that goes through this. Uh, we're limited in what we can do in uh, public agencies. So this cycle, I'll just look, skip to the end here. I uh, now include in this cycle, we've got to figure out in addition to how to generate the evidence, how to get it into practice, how to measure that we're doing it. We've got to develop um, methods to um, block or overcome misinformation in the system if it's going to work. And probably the most uh, crazy piece of data that I've seen is a really good study that showed that primary care physicians in the U.S. are as influenced by whether they watch Fox News or CNN as the American public is. And so um, as we deal with this, we've got to uh, modify what we do so that if we have the right answer for health, um, we can convince people that it's right. So this is the final slide. I won't go through it in detail. I think you've gotten the message I have. This is very much work in progress. It's sort of a rough draft of thinking, but um, I certainly welcome your comments and criticisms, which I'm used to receiving when I come to Oxford. Thank you for a really interesting uh, for the broader perspective and lots of the talks that we're used to. Um, so yeah, it's very, very kind of interesting to hear. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions and then we've got um, nearly 10 minutes. So um, could, if better organized, answer a lot of your, your good hearing box. We've got an MVP that can do MR to maybe complicate drug development um, and do trial and relation to repurposing. We've got, um, uh, we can do pragmatic trials. We can do post-marketing work and then an, uh, an elderly population leads to use a lot of um, uh, medications and we, we could do quality improvement at a, at a better scale. We're not organized to, is it, is it time to to have a more formal relationship with the FDA to solve some of these problems. We need a little regulatory help in the... Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I actually think um, two of the organizations that can come closest to what the dream is, which I obviously is not my unique dream, this is other people's work, would be the VA system in the U.S. and the NHS. I mean, the NHS yeah. is doing a lot of this, but I would argue imperfectly right now, and it could get... Um, much better at doing it, given what's already in place. Um, and how to protect the people who do not want to be involved in this kind of, you know, kind of centric misconduct, because if it's not identified early on, it can be carried out to great state of success, I don't know, like of profit. So how can we make that, that more stringent, more regular? You ever seen the show 60 Minutes in the U.S.? I got a 60 Minutes appearance because I had to deal with one of the most prominent examples of manipulation of genomic data that has occurred yet in our society. And um, I'll, I'll be brief, but because I, I think, um, uh, first of all, I would say if you're going to bring something to the FDA, um, an advantage of having the FDA is that we actually look at the raw data. And so um, manipulation of data brought to the FDA is much more difficult to do than in academia. 
I guess my second point, which I won't belabor, but I used to give hour long lectures about this. Academia needs to wake up and have much better systems of data provenance and ability to oversee its own work. And I know there's a lot of work that goes on on this, but um, sloppiness in rare diseases is an enormous problem for the FDA because it's very common for us to get applications from well-intended. Usually, I think it's well-intended. People that don't understand that unless you have assays that are relatively precise, when we approve a product, that means it's free to be distributed to everybody. And so, um, and then we end up with a messy situation where it looks like the treatment's good, but the data's not really good, and uh, it's really a problem. I am very worried right now about something that's happening, which is both in Europe and the U.S., the the belief that homebrewed academic stuff can just be distributed to people as a treatment. Um, I take it for granted that the current regulatory system won't work because there is a lot of homebrew needed and stuff done in, let's say, a, a unit in an academic hospital. Uh, but there's got to be there's got to be controls because we have so many cases of misuse of that uh, privilege. And I think Europe actually has a bigger issue than we have right now with that. So um, a lot to work on. Please work on it. We need we need help. Sorry. Hey, Mike, can we comment on the way in which currently regulation on clinical trials very much appears to be very much focused on the risks of doing something? Um, and at the expense of um, uh, the risks of not doing it, by which I mean that um, the regulation is or guidance is trying to ensure that whatever is done is done well. But if it's overinterpreted, it's actually maybe preventing research, particularly on innovative treatments, from going forward. And I wonder whether in pushing forward with your agenda, there was some, would be some value in trying to quantify um, the cost of not doing the things that could be done um, due to the current regulatory environment. Um, because if, if you don't have a sense of what you're losing in terms of improvements in public health, then you're, the incentives for making change um, may not be significantly strong. You know, we've been talking about this for decades, right? <laughs> I, I think the only way to get into this in the U.S. right now is to actually do it by reverse engineering. That is, as we address this, pri uh, let's take this primary care research network at, at the NIH, and we say, okay, here are the top 10 questions that need to be answered in clinical practice for the U.S., and people say, okay, if you do it by the way things are currently being done, you'll be able to do one, <laughs> Um, but if we stop doing a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter, you can actually answer all 10 questions. I, that's the only way I can think, because doing it the other way, it just seems to always fail. And I do think it partly relates to the fact that um, there's almost no amount of money that a company is unwilling to spend if they think they have a good product to get it through that original hurdle of initial FDA approval. And then people just extrapolate that to everything else, unfortunately. But arguing this rationally doesn't seem to work. So I want to, um, you can see a, a scheme here. Whether it will work or not, I don't know. Thank you. And I was impressed that I didn't hear in your talk the phrase precision medicine. And if Francis Collins had given that talk, I know that now, but certainly two or three years ago, it probably would have all been about it right drug to the right patient at the right time. Uh, in oncology now, we're using drugs based on small phase two studies. It's never a phase three. Has precision medicine been oversold as the solution to these problems? Well, I mean, you probably can guess my answer is yes. But that doesn't mean there's not a role for precision medicine. And at least in my view, precision in medicine is a statistical concept. And I think this... One thing I've learned, uh, the human brain is configured to create binary yes-no decisions. 
And what we're dealing with in medicine is, you know, it's an old saying, it's probabilistic. Um, and in order to generate probabilities, you have to actually have a sample that includes the populations of interest. And a lot of the discussion, interestingly, in the last 48 hours with UK and also at EMA is going to be about these counter currents running where people say we have to have diversity. And then people say we have to have smaller and smaller trials. Like sickle cell disease gene editing was 82 patients. That was the total sample size. And we're going to extrapolate that to the entire universe of sickle cell patients. I, I sort of rest my case there. But I'd also point out um, Dr. Burton Oley, the new NIH director, is a cancer surgeon. She is very focused on the issue that, yes, precision oncology is important, but in the post-market space, the public health trials can't be done because you got to pay for the drugs in the comparison, and they're so expensive that the public health budgets can't take the cost. So we're going to have to solve that problem in cancer. Okay, it's just gone past two o'clock, so if anybody needs to escape now, then they're excused. But otherwise, I think there's... If, you, if you're happy to answer a few more sure. questions, I think yeah. this is the, I should have talked shorter. This is the most interesting yeah. part. Sorry. How can you ensure that FDA employees don't get biased? Well, let me, let me make uh, two and maybe three points there. The first, and I feel like I have to say this over and over, the amount of money that the medical products industry has is tiny compared to the amount of money that the healthcare delivery system has in the U.S. and in the world. And I can tell you, having to deal with Congress, the lobbying of the pharmaceutical industry is minor. Well, not minor is not the right word. I would just say the academic medical centers are equal in their because every congressperson knows that the primary employer in their district now, for the most part, is a university and an academic medical center. So I think the, the positioning of the question, I fundamentally disagree with. But having said that, um, there is no doubt that um, industry spends a lot of time trying to influence the FDA and psychoanalyzing the reviewers and all sorts of things. The reviewers, um, you know, if you can think of a better system, let me know. But um, I'm one of like six political appointees and 18,000 people that work at the FDA. Everyone else is a civil servant getting a civil servant salary and not allowed to have financial conflicts of interest. And so um, and uh, the commissioner as a political appointee does not make decisions about individual products unless there's a dispute that goes through multiple layers of and so it's only like a handful of times in the history of the FDA that a political appointee has had any say. That, that's right. And it's almost any company because, I mean, the example is even the airlines, because they serve food and we regulate food. So our funds go into um, diversified mutual funds. And if you get caught... It's a crime to um, make trades on regulated. I see everybody nodding their heads. <laughs> There's a lot of pain. And if you want to talk to my wife, Lydia, about the forms that have to be filled out, um, it's almost a full-time job. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I think we're going to start the new system of evidence generation. But if that evidence changes our knowledge about a, a licensed drug, it might discover that drug A is better than drug B. It might discover that uh, a particular drug needs to be given in a different way. It might discover, discover some new adverse effect. It might actually discover that some previously reported adverse effect actually turns out not to, not to have been real because the trials are larger, more real world, and so on. If this is a post-regulated space, What's the FDA going to do about that new information? Are you just going to ignore it? Are you going to act? I, that's a great question, and it's one that I really, really believe need to be solved. Many people will start thinking about that by saying, did you ever see a doctor or a pharmacist who actually read an FDA label? 
The answer is no, but we all know that it, it's embedded in the infrastructure of the information systems and has a huge impact on what gets prescribed for obvious reasons. Um, and so uh, we do have this gap, and uh, we talked earlier about ADHD, and not, you know, not a lethal disease, although very important to society. And if you look at the FDA label, it only has short-term studies. And I was um, on a tear about this because we're having shortages right now because it also is associated with addiction and overdoses. And so the Drug Enforcement Agency puts a cap on it. And I was on a tear saying we don't have long-term data. It turned out the NIH had done two really good studies of long-term ADHD meds, very positive in terms of functioning in society and school and all those but it appears nowhere in the FDA label. And I do remember uh, the aspirin citizens petition, but a citizens petition is not a not a efficient way to get that information in. So it's a it's a it's a hole in the system now that needs to be fixed. I'm looking at younger people here in the FDA who might be able to fix it. Another couple of questions. may be beneficial for a drug manufacturer, but in some cases may not be. What are the sort of policy levers that you as, you know, within your role in the FDA can pull, whether that's to create incentives for post-marketing studies or forcing functions for the studies that would actually encourage them to sort of more so than they do? Um, sadly, for somebody like me, our levers are extremely limited because anytime we exceed our statutory authority that is what's written in the u.s law we're going to go to court <laughs> um and so um this is why I'm, i show that slide that has all the other agencies which really have to do with um clinical practice and public health uh payment for we we all need to be involved in this to create a system where it's easier to do the right thing than the wrong thing. But but your question really is another way of saying what I, the point I was trying to make is if you let industry fund the studies, show me the corporate board that's going to approve a study being done, which is likely to show that your drug is worse than the comparator. It's just, you know, you can't do that when you're running a business. And so this is why I'm so focused on this part of the system and the role that others can play. You might think that payers would have an interest in this. You, um, so far, the payers, other than CMS now because of IRA, have not been very interested. A, a little story that might help you remember this. I got invited to the Association of um, Insurers in the U.S., AHIP, it's called, America's Health Insurance Plans. And it turned out the reason they invited me is they wanted to put my feet to the fire on why we're not getting accelerated approval studies done. Uh, quickly enough, and I, I actually had a great time because it, as I was thinking about it, I thought, wait a minute, what are they doing to get the studies done? Because the number one thing that practitioners tell me is they're trying to do these studies is we are under all this pressure to generate revenue, and the insurers make it almost impossible if you have something new you're introducing like a clinical trial. Their answer was they were doing nothing. So we have a paper which has been submitted now about what the payers should do as part of this. But it's just one of many members of the ecosystem. You can also ask, what about health systems themselves? Um, not doing enough, in my view. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, I think the introduction of the term real world data is useful. I mean, it's, you know, just emphasizing that properly randomized trials can use real world data. Um, we can use, use the data to generate the actual investigations, but I think your use of the term real world evidence to include both randomized and non randomized evidence, while others are using real world evidence only to mean non randomized evidence. I think this is confusing. You've got two different usages for the same term. And yes, it is true that randomized trials actually are giving you much more reliable evidence about the real world. So if you want to know what's giving evidence about the real world, yes, you should include randomized trials in there. 
But to use to try and use that term, I mean, the FDA got this in various regulations and draft regulations. It's probably inadequate. But I think real world data is a useful introduction of terminology. But real world evidence, you do need to distinguish quite seriously between randomised and non randomised. The terminology is used should distinguish between these two. They're not just part of the same system. I, I certainly don't want different groups I, of people using the same thing to mean something or right. be the opposite. I completely so, agree. I completely <laughs> I almost completely agree with everything you said, but let, just two quick stories to sort of make points related to this. I was on a campaign to get rid of the term real world evidence for just the reason you gave when 21st century cures was passed into law. And the way it works is the FDA can't obviously doesn't write legislation. Congress writes legislation, but we give technical input to the legislation, which means we, you know, then make things happen. But what happened in 21st century cure is they have a period where they lock the doors and the Democrats and Republicans get in a room and fight it out for the final bill. And I was horrified when the bill came out It instructed the FDA to use real world evidence and to find it specifically don't use randomized trials. And so uh, we were left with a dilemma. This is written into law. And so what we decided to do about it was we had another bill coming through, which was a chance for us to try to repair the law as best we could. I would have liked to have done away with the whole term, but to preserve the idea that this that using real world data includes randomized trials, uh, we got an addendum uh, written into the law um, to do this. And um, so our next maneuver, uh, Dr. Marson here is in charge. Um, we are working with the NIH to come up with a short glossary of key terms where people are using different words to say the same thing and the same words to to say different things. The idea being, if the FDA says that the regulated industry is likely to do it, and if the NIH says that the academic community is likely to do it. So we want to come out with a joint statement um, that defines some of these terms and tries to get people to repetitively use the same words for the same thing. But unfortunately, we can't get rid of the word real world evidence because it's written into U.S. law. Frustrating as that may be. <laughs>